Great. So we're here today to talk about how to protect your mental and financial well-being at work. And um, the webinar is being hosted by Unmind. And for anyone that hasn't heard of Unmind, we are a cultural change platform for mental health and well-being. And we are a proactive um, wellness partner for organizations around the world. Now, we're quite used to tackling some of these tough but very important um, subject matters, um, all of which contribute to our sense of wellness. And um, as mentioned, we'll be talking about you know, protecting both our mental and financial well-being in the workplace. Many of us will be you know, facing financial difficulties mm -hmm. and understand that they can be often you know, shrouded in shame and secrecy. So we're here to sort of smash that stigma today. Um, we understand that employees are facing incredibly difficult decisions at the moment, and we've got lots of employers joining us as well who are thinking about how they can best support their team members and what the right interventions might be. And we are incredibly fortunate today to be joined by a fantastic panel. We've got a member of our own um, science team from Unmind, uh, a financial coach, um, and two employers as well from different industries, so who will all bring a very broad range of experience and expertise to the webinar today. Um, so let's kick off with some intros. So I'm Megan, I'm the VP of People at Unmind, and um, I have the honor of leading our sort of like HR team here at Unmind. Um, um, Sophia, I'm gonna hand over to you first. I'd love to hear a bit more about your background and what you'll be bringing to the webinar today. Thanks, Megan. Um, so I am a clinical psychologist. Um, at Unmind, I'm part of our science team um, and psychology team, and we really, I suppose, work to ensure um, the clinical quality of everything that we do at Unmind. Um, before I joined Unmind, I worked for many years in um, the UK's National Health Service, where I'm based um, in the UK, um, working with people with a um, broad range of, of mental health problems and also supporting staff teams um, in health and social care with with their own well-being um, so yeah really lovely to be here and looking forward to the discussion thanks Sophia Kimberly I'll hand over to you sure thank you so much and I'm Kimberly I'm man manager of total rewards from pros um, we are a software company based in Houston Texas where I also res reside uh, but I'm excited to be here to bring the employer perspective on how we support our population with not only financial well-being, but how that ties into a more holistic <laughs> approach to overall well-being with our employees. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And, and Tom, thank you for joining us today as well. I'll hand over to you now for your intro. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Hi, everybody. My name is Tom Smith. I'm the Reward and Pensions Manager for Estee Lauder Companies uh, in the UK and Ireland. Uh, I've been at Este now for just over three years, leading our employee benefits. Uh, my original sort of background is, is more in pensions, uh, so I've really sort of understood the importance of saving for your retirement and the impact it can have on your mental and financial well-being. Uh, looking forward to sort of bringing some ideas of what we've been doing as an employer to help our colleagues. Thank you so much. And Martha, I'll hand over to you. Hi, I'm Martha Menard. Um, my background is in behavioral health. Um, I've been with Questus for about five years, and um, I develop financial education programs and uh, lead our coaching team at Questus. Thank you so much. Like I said, you know, a really diverse panel here today. You've all got lots of different experiences and from different industries. So I'm looking forward to diving into the conversation. Um, before we do that, I have prepared some, um, some questions. And like I said, we'll get to some questions at the end of the webinar as well. Um, for those that have just joined us, I'm gonna sort of just spend a couple of minutes setting the scene and um, then let's get started. Um, so many of us will be, you know, talking and hearing lots about the soaring cost of living. Um, because everybody is impacted by it. And we know that one in three employees feel financial anxiety and you know, this can also affect their performance at work. So almost half of adults are heading into debt as well. Um, but changes in within you know, the company's grasp and that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, you know, we know that employers need to create cultures where people feel empowered to be open about financial worries and 
have in place the right resources for those that are struggling. Um, so we're here today to open up that conversation and we're gonna be combining both financial expertise and also psychology to really help um, organizations help their people with the stress of personal um, finance challenges. Um, we're going to be exploring this um, in um, a values framework that we call the I, the we, and the all. Um, so the I section focuses on our personal finances and, and how this might um, impact us as individuals and so how we can really support ourselves. Um, and then hopefully we will then take that to think about how we can use those skills that we've learned to support others. And that's the we section. Um, so that might be your, your colleagues or sort of like team finances. And then finally, we'll get to the all. And this is where we think about, you know, organizational change and organizational wide, um, you know, our culture and how we can really support everybody across um, our organizations. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a moment and I'm going to get going with the, the questions. Sophia, I think I'll sort of throw this to you on first actually. Um, could you talk us through how financial and mental well-being interlink in your experience? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that there is a clear link between poverty and mental health problems. Um, but poor mental health isn't inevitable if we're experiencing financial difficulty. So it's not that everyone that's exposed to financial difficulty will develop a mental health problem. Um, and I think it's important to say as well that support from our community and from our workplace can really help to buffer this and prevent financial difficulties from impacting our mental health. Um, of course, um, it's completely normal to experience really difficult emotions like anxiety, um, shame or guilt when we're experiencing financial difficulties or where we're facing pressure with our finances. And the particular emotions that we experience can really be related to our beliefs that we have about money. And these tend to be shaped by our experiences in life, in early life, sometimes in our families. Um, that shape how we how we believe how our beliefs about money how we how we see money and its impact on us and those sorts of um, feelings that we have about money can really shape our response so if we're feeling anxious often a way that we use to cope with anxiety is avoidance so we might avoid um, opening letters, looking at our finances, and that can really fuel things. And I suppose in the long term, um, make things worse. It can be an unhelpful coping strategy. And I think what's important to remember and to acknowledge for all of us is that all emotions are valid. And it's really important to be able to recognize them, first of all, um, and also to maybe look at the impact that they might be having um, and showing ourselves some compassion as well, really normalizing that it's, it's completely normal to feel whatever emotion you might feel related to financial difficulty, anger, anxiety, stress, shame, um, and giving yourself some compassion um, around that and then taking, trying to take proactive steps. So there's um, also a clear link between chronic stress and, and decision making. So chronic stress, um, which, which financial difficulty can bring, really alters how we process information in our minds and can make us more prone to, I guess, more impulsive or short-term decisions, which can really impact um, how we manage our finances. So we can be kind of really pushed for quick fixes like um, payday loans or high interest um, credit cards or Black Friday deals. Um, so um, our, our feelings of anxiety and helplessness around finances can be in some way exploited um, and worsen, worsen those issues. So I'd say really, it's, it's just really important for us to take care of ourselves, attending to that stress um, that financial difficulties can bring. So we're really in a position to use um, healthy coping mechanisms like problem solving and seeking out trustworthy financial advice and support as well. Thank you so much. We're all human and it's so nice to have that sort of like acknowledgement and to remind ourselves that actually all of our emotions um, are valid. Um, and, and talking about trusted financial advice, um, Martha, maybe this is a, a great moment to sort of like hand over to you. You know, we've just touched on how financial and mental well-being interlinks. 
why do you think this has now become a workplace issue? Well, um, <clears throat> I think the biggest reason is that um, when you're feeling anxious about your finances, um, you're not going to, you know, leave that at the door when you leave home, that um, those emotions um, are going to uh, come to work with you. And um, that that stress and um, anxiety can really interfere with um, being able to focus, being able to, you know, be productive in the workplace. And I think, you know, most of us um, do look to the work that we do um, to have some sense of um, purpose and meaning. And even if our job, you know, isn't, you know, we're not out there saving the world, we want to feel good about how we spend our time and we want to, you know, to feel productive and financial stress can, can get in the way of that. Absolutely. And do you, um, you know, in the field of work that you do, can, do you have any sort of um, advice on how we can sort of like try and gain some confidence or clarity over our pine, uh, uh, financial, you know, well-being? Well, you know, that is um, one of the reasons that um, in my role at Questus, we really focus on working with people both through um, group coaching and one-to-one -one coaching. Um, my experience as a coach is that most people already have a pretty good sense of what they need to do. Um, most personal finance advice really kind of boils down to um, spend less and save more. And people know that they need to do that. What they struggle with is how do I do that given my particular situation? And that's where I find coaching can really be helpful that just having somebody that you can talk to or sometimes just hearing somebody else's story of how they've managed a particular situation can be really helpful um, in helping people explore their options and come up with um, really a plan of action that, um, that will work for them. It's not so much um, us telling people what they should do because they kind of already know that and they are the experts on their situation. Um, so they know what, you know, what resources they have, what they um, are likely willing or not willing to do. And we just help them kind of come up with their plan. It's not us telling them what they should do. They're figuring out what's what's feasible for them and what's realistic for them. I think that's really interesting, Martha, what you're saying about having a plan, because um, what we know from the evidence as well in terms of the impact, emotional impact of finances is that increasing our sense of control um, around our finances can make a huge, huge difference. So um, absolutely. absolutely accessing um, coaches and having a proper plan can really help with the emotional aspect as well. Definitely. And I love Sometimes the idea of just talking to somebody. Yeah. Exactly. And, and sort of like sharing of experiences, you know, I've spoken sort of like the introduction about um, how there's lots of, you know, stigmas tied to this subject, but actually, you know, by opening up that conversation and sharing experiences or hearing other people's stories, like it, it helps normalize actually that we're, we're not alone, that everyone um, does experience this. Um, Kimberly, I'd love to hear um, from an organizational perspective, um, We've just touched on sort of like supporting ourselves and then, you know, getting involved in sort of like a group aspect. But how can we support others, um, you know, that are experiencing worries, whether it's a, a colleague or a direct report or a loved one? Um, what have you done to support others? Sure. So for our organization, you know, I have the pleasure to work for in a company that is very paternalistic and we're a feedback culture. And so, you know, we try to identify any ways we can communicate and make it a two-way dialogue with our employees. And through those conversations, uh, you know, we're able to learn a lot, and especially with financial well-being, you know, our one that is one of the lenses because we took a step back, especially with the pandemic, to identify what were the reasons or the contributing factors for burnout, causes of stress, and financial components, like everything has that has been said between our discussion today, that is a huge factor. And so through that, you know, it, we took a step back on identifying that financial well-being is, in, in our opinion, one of the most important aspects of our holistic approach to well-being. 
we have several pillars that you know that encompasses our overall well-being approach financial being one of them and so we you know through those efforts we've identified you know that there's not a one size fits all to everybody's story when it comes to finances we had to take a look at our population and then understand our demographics not only through generational differences because we have a wide range of ages within our workforce but even globally because what we were looking at from a financial perspective in the US may not resonate with some of our employees that have that reside in the UK, for example, or in Germany or in Bulgaria. So that I think was the first um, big task for us to understand was who was our population? What were the areas that we wanted to address? And so as an example for this year, savings and budgeting, that was a big one, you know, especially when light of inflation and money just not stretching the way it used to and making sure that we were putting our employees one, um, bringing, bringing information to them more directly. So we did a lot more webinar features where they could get education from experts. And so that was something that we, we did um, and made it easy for them to access. But then too, looking at our different resources and making sure that the education pieces that employees were aware and looking at all opportunities to highlight that. And anybody in the benefits world knows how hard it is to drive engagement or to you communicate a lot, but it doesn't necessarily resonate. So we tried to take a step back and you know figure out how can we communicate better. And so for our our organization, we actually created a well-being team. Um, it's a partnership between HR, so our benefits team and HR, with our employees that are representative of not only different um, different business units but different geographies. So that way we could have a a broad representation of the varying needs of our employees. And so through those efforts, we really engaged this network of employees to help get the messaging out there for the different uh, focuses that we had on financial well-being. That's great. Activating champions is, yeah, is hugely powerful. And what you mentioned there is sort of like the one size um, fits no one really, really resonates as well. So I mind from um, uh, an employee perspective, we're in three different locations and when it comes to finances or or anything, we really have to think about, you know, those regions and individuals um, very differently. Tom, have you found the same the same challenges? You're in the reward space as well. Um, how, what have you put in place to support others? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think here in the UK, um, our benefit strategy is sort of um, relatively well developed. So I feel like we've got a lot of um, options for our employees to, to look at. And as, as Kimberly mentioned, the challenge, right, is, is to get those employees to sort of engage with the benefits that we have. Uh, we In the UK, we have quite a, a varied type of employee. So we've got manufacturing and distribution uh, all the way to retail and corporate. And so communicating to those different populations is really challenging because the retail staff, for example, can't just dial into a webinar and, and, and learn about the benefits and learn about how to manage their money in a, a more efficient way. So we've had to be sort of quite flexible and try and do different types of communication and trying to avoid just bombarding and spamming people with emails, but trying to be more engaging and doing short video clips and infographics and, and, and uh, uploading on social sort of company websites. Uh, to try and highlight that. Um, but ultimately, I think set very similar to Kimberley, uh, we are quite a paternalistic company and we try and encourage sort of compassion between our sort of colleagues, managers and leaders. Um, and so that if people are struggling, they can reach out to whoever they feel com uh, comfortable with. Uh, and then hopefully we have a solution or we can point them in the right direction of, of what might help help them. Uh, I also agree that there's not a one size fits all everyone. Um, so we do have to be flexible. We do have to be adaptable uh, and we have to look at the personal circumstances and try and act accordingly in, in, in the most compassionate way we can. Thank you. Um, and Martha, I'm sure that resonates as well with the lots of the, um, different sort of people that you'll be um, used to coaching. Um, and we spoke about sort of the importance of like driving engagement with benefits and, you know, financial education. But can you give any advice or your perspective on how to sort of take that from financial education to sort of action? Um, sure. you know, we spoke um, about the importance of having a plan. Is there any other, other advice that you might give? Um, well, I think it's really important to um, to meet people where they are. 
um, and to be ready to engage with them when they're ready. Um, because I find it's, um, you know, nobody wakes up and says, wow, it's a beautiful day. I think I'll sit down and do a budget today. Uh, mm -hmm. That's never happened in, in um, all my years of coaching. Um, it's often a life event that will trigger the realization for somebody that, gosh, I, you know, I need to, to do something about my finances, or I, I really need to get my, my act together here. Um, so just kind of being ready to meet people uh, when they're ready to hear that information um, and also giving them the opportunity to be applying that information, I think is really critical. Um, there's a lot of research that financial education alone does very little to actually change behavior. There was uh, one meta-analysis that found it's less than a tenth of a percent in terms of just hearing information, you have to both be motivated to apply it and you know have a reason um, to actually apply that information. So um, again, that's another big reason that we really focus on what is one small thing that you can do now that's going to improve the situation. I love that. And and to what Sophia said before, you know, about taking control of that feeling, like feeling like you are in control. If you break it down into smaller steps of one thing that you can achieve now. Um, Sophia, do you have any advice maybe on how to create those healthy habits as well? If we've got our financial education um, and we've got sort of a bit of a plan, how do we create a sort of a healthy habit around our financial well-being? Yeah, so I suppose in terms of um in terms of I guess creating a habit, what we'd always advise is to start small um and achievable and and build on that. Um, because that's the only way that we're going to to motivate ourselves is doing something, taking small steps or breaking down a larger goal into smaller steps, um, and each step being achievable. And that kind of sense of achievement then that we get from accomplishing each of those tiny steps builds and motivates us um, and can help us to um to maintain that habit. I think also keeping ourselves accountable, whether that's sharing that with someone else in our life um, or telling someone else that about our goal can also really help or buddying up with someone as well to encourage ourselves. Um, but I think it's also important to balance that out with um, the economic situation that we're finding ourselves in and that actually a lot of people will be struggling um, with issues that are far beyond their control and I think it's just important to keep that keep that in mind um, throughout our discussion today that of course there are things that we can do as individuals to take a bit more control um, but there is this wider picture where we don't have much control and there is a lot of uncertainty and I think what we're talking about here is really focusing on the things that we do have control over so on our circle of influence so of course there's lots of stuff going on that will make us anxious understandably make us angry even um, but it's about focusing our attention on okay that stuff it is the way it is I don't have much influence over it let me focus on what I do have influence over thank you and I know that you know that's so true I'm like, oh, sorry Martha I'll hand to you I was just going to say that is so true and we um at Questus we're often reminding people of exactly that thing that you know there are all of these things going on um, there are larger forces at work um, that you know you can't do anything about so you know focus on what you can control absolutely um, and a big focus for us um, at mind has been about um, you know supporting managers support their teams and and um, we recently released um, Made for Managers. And it's making me think, you know, what role do managers and leaders play um, when it comes to financial well-being? If they think that, you know, some of the, one of their team members might be struggling, um, is it, you know, is should they intervene? Should they get involved? Um, I'd love to hear, any, you know, from anyone on the panel, what your thoughts are in terms of the roles of leaders and managers. I, th I think Martha said it earlier. Um, I think if people are struggling financially or, or mentally, uh, they don't bring their best self to work and therefore that's going to impact their productivity, their, their team and, and the work. And so I, I personally think that managers and leaders do have a really big um, part to play uh, in identifying 
where people are struggling and 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 helping them where they can um And exactly what Tom said to add on to that, I mean, I think it's important not only for managers because they're going to be the ones to identify those trends since they are on the front line of working with their employees. But what we what we we don't expect our managers to be um, the subject matter experts in the field. We want them to have the education that they need and awareness of the different resources so they can tie in or bring in the proper um, counterparts to come and support the employees. And I think just together, working together with management is essential in making sure we're addressing the support that our employees need, not only on the financial aspect, but in, in any other way too. And I think as well, part of that is creating a, a team culture um, where open conversations can happen and trusting relationships um, between the manager and, and their people, um, where people do feel able to say if they are struggling and do feel able to ask for help. Um, I think, we know the evidence is really clear that in times of recession um, and economic decline, um, li decline in living standards, um, they're consistently associated with increased um, distress, um, increased suicidal thoughts. Um, so I suppose as well, I think it's important, of course, the responsibility is not only on managers, but for managers to feel equipped to have conversations around mental health and sensitive topics like suicide, um, at least a grounding in that so that if that does come up, they feel equipped to have that conversation and signpost that person onward. So being aware as well of the support available from the organization. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think there's um, managers play a key role you know as they do in, in any organization but there can often be a pressure that they um you know need to respond in the moment but it's more around you know they're reminding them that they're not the experts that they're there to sort of you know hold the space and sort of like open the conversation um and signpost to the resources that are available and um you know tom and kimberly gave great advice as to how you're um really sort of driving engagement and, and communication of those benefits throughout your organizations um, and so, Vera, I know that something you're really passionate about as well is, is, is psychological safety in the workplace and, and creating that within teams. Um, I guess this extends to that, this conversation um, as well. So any advice that you might give to managers as to how to create that psychological safety within their teams? Yeah, I mean, that's such a huge topic, but I'd say um, I'd say a big thing can be just acknowledging to a team that, you know, things are tough at the moment, acknowledging that people have a life outside of work and they may be impacted in lots of different ways. Um, I think managers have a real um, role in terms of modeling to their team um, ways of being and ways of, of behaving and acting, um, showing vulnerability as well. Um, that um, they might struggle with some things at times. Um, of course, there's a there's a line uh, um, a line to walk in terms of how much we share as a manager because we also want to contain our team's anxiety. Um, but sharing some some humanness with our team um, that really goes to kind of help model that that's okay for our team as well to be human to talk about what's going on outside of work um, and to not always be at their best. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. That sort of like vulnerability and authenticity really helps build um, trust. Tom and Kimberly, I'd love to hear you. So what's worked within your organizations and um, the role of leaders and, and them sort of like driving engagement either with benefits or, or well-being in general across the organization? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, I, I sort of see um, companies and, and Estee as sort of a, a trusted resource. Um, and as we've been talking about having managers and leaders being able to refer to those sort of trusted benefits that we provide to our employees give, gives, I think, gives our colleagues um, a useful um, library of information um, whereby if you go onto Google, you can get all sorts of information about how to manage your financial well-being and you don't know what to trust and what, what, what is right and what is maybe misleading. Um, so I think it's really good that we have these tools in place that we, colleagues can use and we can direct people who need them to them. And for our organization, we've tried to reevaluate how, you know, the, basically the manager toolkit that is available to our managers to help them and uh, help support them in certain areas with their employee base. And so what we've developed is we've actually implemented for this year live leader sessions, which are monthly 
uh, sessions for managers only to talk on various topics through our feedback because we pulse our we pulse survey our employees, but we also get you know specific feedback from our managers. And so this is an area that we've leveraged these live leader sessions to drive specific topics and discussions with our managers to create the awareness for, as an example, maybe not necessarily with just financial well-being for our organization, but on the well-being resources. How do you support your employees on having those conversations? We've actually implemented with our quarterly check-ins with managers and their teams, well-being as one of those components. So our Q2 focus this year was to talk about well-being. And so that was an opportunity to create that safe space, safe space uh, between managers and their teams on having those dialogues where things like financial um, stressors or anything that may come up that impacted their well-being. That was a great time to, to not only start that conversation, but to keep it going. And that's even though we had a highlight for Q2, our consistent messaging throughout the year is well-being is a strong component for our culture. And we want to make sure that our, our managers are continually having those conversations with their employees and recognizing that they may have been okay, you know, at the last check-in, but things change and, you know, that they, they want to make sure that their employees have the trust in them, that they can come in and talk to them, or at least to start the conversation so they know where to go and get help. Yeah, I think that is so important, Kimberly, to start that conversation. And again, as Sophia was saying, you know, build that trust and that psychological safety. Um, and I loved your idea there around, you know, making sure that managers are supported as well and doing sessions just for managers. I think it's so important that managers have that peer network themselves and that support network that they can lean on um, when they need support as well. So I think that's such a great takeaway. Martha, I'd love to hear from you around, you know, if there's any um, you know, employers that have joined the webinar today and they're sort of like, weighing up whether you know there are any benefits to the organization of offering sort of like financial um well-being support what's your what's your thoughts on that well i think um as a benefit it's becoming um more popular more well known i think it's something that employees are looking for um actually a lot of um a lot of employees do look to their employer to um, provide um, some kind of financial wellness benefit. Um, and what we found at Questus is that um, just through looking at our own internal data is that um, people who use the financial wellness benefit are about 33% more likely to remain with the employer. So um, besides having people um, be bringing their best selves to work um, and being more focused and productive in the workplace, um, we feel strongly that it can reduce turnover cost for the employer. So there's a direct benefit to, to the bottom line there, both in a direct and an indirect way. Mm -hmm financial benefit for the organization of providing financial benefit I love that um and it, and it kind of links me to um my next question that is around you know we spoke earlier about sort of the um the cost of living crisis and how that's like in, impacting people it's also impacting organizations and lots of organizations will be thinking about you know where they're spending their money and you know where they need that they can you know reduce costs um in order to support themselves does anyone on the panel have any advice of any sort of like budget friendly um, financial well-being initiatives that um, organizations can offer to employees um, or that you've seen work well? So for our company, we've taken a look because you know, I mean, budget, as you said, it, it, we have to find pennies and couch cushions, <laughs> or at least I feel like I have to do that. But, um, you know, I've taken um, a step back and looked at our different our existing vendor relationships and identified opportunities to work for financial components on what, where could we leverage our existing rela relationships for little to no cost, um, where we can add on benefits or promote those benefits or taking an opportunity to, to relearn what benefits we actually do have with these vendors so that we could promote them. And so, you know, for, I'll just talk about, at least on the financial space, we have a great relationship with our retirement vendor that supports our overall wealth uh, programs. And just looking at different education pieces, and so that's a, where I had mentioned previously, you know, identifying the topics that resonated with employees, savings and budget, 
you know, market volatility was another one and it, uh, leveraging their experts to bring these education sessions to our employees. And so that was a budget friendly way that we were able to um, bring some value to our employees, information that resonated very well with them. Um, they really enjoyed these and found it very helpful. And then just looking at um, our benefit offerings for things, again, relearning some of those benefits that maybe I'd forgotten about and, and just refining them and then re-promoting them and using this as a new opportunity to educate our employees for all of these great things that we have. Um, I'm a big fan of group coaching. Um, I find that sometimes that can feel um, more comfortable for the individual rather than meeting directly one-on-one -on -one with a coach that sometimes they can still um, get the information um, that they need and learn how, you know, some different ways to apply it um, through that group format. Um, one of the things that we really enjoy, um, our team of coaches and I do a, a weekly live Ask Us Anything uh, webinar where people can just show up and ask uh, personal finance questions of our coaches. And um, one of the ways that we encourage people to do that, money can feel kind of taboo to talk about sometimes. A lot of us were raised, um, you know, grew up in our families with uh, uh, with the belief that, you know, well, you know, nice people don't talk about money um, and it can feel really taboo to do it. However, people are also very curious and they're also willing to talk about money when they feel that it will be helpful to somebody else. Um, we've actually done some surveys and, you know, found that something like two thirds of people feel better talking about money if they feel that it will be helpful to somebody else. So we really encourage people to um, email us with their questions ahead of time. And, you know, then we go over them um, during the webinar and we have a pretty dedicated following of people that, you know, show up for this every week. Um, and so I think that that group format can be very cost effective for an employer. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, here, here at Estee, what, what we've tried to do is come up with a sort of benefits communication strategy in terms of sort of highlighting relevant benefits um, at sort of poignant times. So as you say, we're going through the cost of living crisis. So we've been trying to highlight our financial benefits uh, and partner with those benefit providers because what we found is they're very willing to uh, do webinars, do um, promotional material to show what, they, what the benefit does and how people can benefit from them. Um, for, for another thing we've noticed, and actually I think I saw a comment in the chat about financial education and should it be in schools, and personally I think the answer is yes, I think the earlier people can understand how to manage their finances better, hopefully it means that they won't get into the point of that they're in crisis, um, but but what, we've, what we did is um, we partnered with um, a financial coach who did uh, a series of webinars uh, and I think it, it was really good to do it with somebody external rather than internal, because then it's not sort of the company telling you, you should be saving and managing your budget. It's somebody who's sort of young and people can relate to who's in a similar position rather than the company says you should be doing this. And we're, I love what you said, Tom, for our um, aspect of at least looking at our younger employees coming into the workforce. We have employee resource groups for different demographics, mm -hmm. and one of them ha happens to be on the young professionals. And so we're identifying and having those conversations, in fact, actually had one with the leader previously on, on financial well-being and what are they hearing from their membership. Um, so that way we can put forward the education and the, the support that they need uh, on that. Um, because I, I think for me, when I look at long-term overall, not only just trying to get through the, the kind of crazy times that we're living in, but looking ahead to retirement, you know, I, we always want to make sure that that's not lost, um, at least in the U.S., because we have to, you know, make sure that we're saving away where we can early. And I didn't get that messaging um, at, in my youth, and I had to learn along the way. And I keep thinking about, you know, if I had, if I had this information earlier before I entered the workforce, how much more of a difference would that have made for me and my overall long-term financial planning goals? And so 
I've taken on that as almost as a mission to see where can we get in earlier and actually having conversations with our talent acquisition team on, you know, when we're looking at campus recruits and in for our intern program, are there going to be ways just to do not even just for specifically to to address for our company, but almost a, a community good of can we do these little workshops to help educate um, some of our younger folks coming into the workforce? I think that's so, so important. And it's something that I wanted to touch on is that not all employee groups will be affected equally. And we know that research is showing that that younger employees have also encountered um, more career disrupt disruptions during co the COVID pandemic. Um, and so they're more likely to experience um, difficulties, financial difficulties, and also associated mental health problems compared to their colleagues. Um, I think equally, um, we need to acknowledge that the intersection between financial stress um, and gender and ethnicity pay gap. So financial hardship is also a diversity and inclusion issue. Um, and uh, there's evidence as well from the 2008-2009 recession that employees with existing mental health problems were more likely to lose their jobs. Um, so people who usually face discrimination may face even more discrimination in periods of, of, of financial hardship in, in society and in our, in our economy. Um, so I think it's just really important to bear that in mind in terms of thinking our, of, of an employee base and how different groups will be affected, affected differently and plan accordingly. Yeah, I think that's so important. Thank you for um, sharing, Sophia, that, you know, we, we say that you know, everyone is affected at the moment, you know, by the cost of living crisis, whether that be employers or employees, but the experience um, is, is definitely not equal. Um, and Kimberly and Tom, just want to pick up on something you both said there around, um, you know, when we're trying to be budget friendly to try and really leverage the resources that we already have access to um, and the vendors. And I think that's so important, and, and we've seen that as well ourselves from our, you know, being a well-being partner to lots of different organisations that, you know, these really difficult topics, you know, of course, as um, Sophia and Martha have touched on, you know, really impact our, our mental well-being and, and how can we leverage, you know, tools and resources like Unmind um, to really support employees during these more difficult times. And um, I've got a slide that I'll share at the end, but, you know, anyone on this call that would like more information, and we've got a handbook that you can download with some, some great um takeaways as well um now before we get to any questions that have dropped into the um chat and just a reminder to anyone that joined um after the notice if you do have any questions or um any feedback or anything that you'd like to know more about please just do click on the um q a at the bottom and we'll make sure that we'll save some time to to get to those um i'd just love to hear from everyone on the panel if you could um maybe just sort of share one key takeaway that you'd want to share with um, anyone on the call, whether it might be a manager or an individual, um, someone that's supporting themselves through financial difficulty or supporting a peer um, or a friend, or it might be, um, you know, a business owner that wants to support their organization. I'd love to you know any one sort of like last takeaway that you might want to, to share. For, for me, it's, um communication uh, making sure you communicate uh, and if you have a problem or if you have an issue or anything no matter how big or small it is tell your partner tell your family tell your friends most likely they have gone through something similar uh, or maybe able to help and suggest solutions uh, don't suffer in silence that is such um, great advice thank you tom Sophia. Yeah, absolutely. I think I would echo that. I think there can be so much shame associated with our finances and being in financial difficulty. Um, and I would really encourage anyone that's struggling to, to reach out. Um, I think um, on a kind of more organizational level, um, I think if, um, I've just seen a comment in the chat around um, including alternatives of how to address financial crises. Um, and I think... Um, organizations offering maybe varying intensities of financial support as well. So acknowledging that everyone is impacted differently. Um, some employees may be concerned about um, mortgages or long-term savings, pensions, and others will be in more kind of immediate financial crisis and offering kind of that range of support to support everyone where they're at. And to tie into everything, I, I agree, communication is key and getting feedback and doing something with it, I think from an, an organizational standpoint is so 
important in, in fostering and creating that trust uh, because I've worked for organizations where, you know, we say we want the feedback and then we get it and we don't do anything with it and it falls flat. And so that has a negative um, connotation as well. So I would say if you're going to ask for the feedback, Try your best to do it. And if you can't, I mean, employees are very understanding when I explain to them of the whys, maybe not now, but we, I've built that trust with our employees on here's why we can't for now, but we're going to continue to evaluate. And, you know, I always make sure that that is a priority. Um, but also from an employee standpoint, if you, uh, if you, if you feel that you're part of an organization that maybe isn't as feedback friendly as others, maybe be that that voice, be that first person to go and talk to somebody because it only takes one person to start something, start a movement for change. And so if, um, if you're struggling with finances and haven't been, have, haven't felt comfortable having that conversation, maybe it's uh, you know your opportunity to lead the charge on starting that and hopefully making some impactful change. I just have to, um, <clears throat> I don't know that I have anything Additional to add, I uh, really agreed with what Tom and Sophia said. Um, I think just realizing that personal finance is personal um, and that people do have different goals and uh, different needs um, and that it's just really important to meet people where they are. Yeah, I think one thing that I would mention as well that sort of um, touches on what you know, you've all just summarized there is um, we're fortunate and mind to actually be offered um, financial coaching. And I know that that's not the case in, in, in all businesses. Um, and I guess originally I probably didn't identify as one of the, the one in three with financial anxieties, but I would definitely say to everyone that you don't know what you don't know. And after just sort of a, a very short call with, with a coach or, or, you know, a financial expert, I felt like I learned so much and, and I really, really sort of like built my confidence. So um, even if you might not be identifying with um, some of the statistics out there, I would really encourage you just to um, be curious and, 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 and explore and just see what help might be out there um, as well. Um, I'm just going to take a moment to um, dip into the, um, the chat. We've got some great questions that have come through. Um, we touched on one earlier that was around how we can um, do better. You know, we talked about how we bring through, you know, stigmas and, and you know, our approach to finance starts much earlier on in our, in our journey as children and what we learn from our families um, and how that links to education. I think there's a, definitely a consensus that we need to be doing more um, to support, you know, in schools and educate. And Kimberly, it's great to hear about your initiative of, of giving back um, and, and starting that education much earlier. Um, we have another... Um, audience member that has asked for, um, it's a great question, it says, do you have any advice on how to talk pay rises or salary reviews with your manager? Does anyone have any advice on how to sort of open up this conversation? I think there are two things that people can do to um, prepare for a conversation like that. Um, one is to um, do a little bit of homework. Um, there are websites now where it's pretty easy to look up a salary range for a given uh, job title and responsibilities. Um, so knowing kind of what the current salary range is, is useful information to have to go into that discussion. Um, I also think um, basically one of the things that ed everybody can do in their in their role at work is to um, just keep track of how you are contributing to the organization, adding value to the organization, um, and keeping track of the impact of projects that you've worked on. You know, so that you can show um, and be able to document um, how you are contributing to the company's success. And, you know, that helps to make the case for, um, you know, for a raise or even a promotion. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's um, a great advice to be sort of very data led and have confidence in and acknowledging the impact that you're having on your organization. Um, we've had another one that's come through here that's, um, you know, any advice, you know, we've talked about this, the I, the we and the all, and this very much focuses on, you know, how we can support others. 
Um, do you have any advice for when you're listening to somebody else's financial issues, um, how you can provide that support? Because for, for many of us, you know, it might feel awkward or, you know, we're not trained in sort of like holding those conversations, um, particularly if we are not in a position to support them financially. Um, so could anyone offer any advice on how to support others? Yeah, I'm happy to take this one. So I think um, we can feel a lot of pressure um, when someone comes to us and opens up to us about whatever that might be um, to solve things. Um, but actually, what we know is that um, just being there for that person and really listening, um, being fully present, listening non-judgmentally can be can is kind of central um, to helping them feel supported. Um, and there's a specific type of listening that we always talk about, which is called active listening. So that means um, being fully present with the person, letting go of whatever else you're doing, any worries that you might have in bringing yourself back to the conversation in your having with that person, um, showing when your body language that you're listening, so facing them, making eye contact, nodding along, um, and then also um, summarizing as they go um, to make sure that you've understood correctly, so paraphrasing maybe, maybe asking questions to clarify, but really just staying with that person and helping them to open up and, and talk, and usually that's plenty to help them feel supported um, and like you've truly heard them you've given them your full attention and you and, and showing care um, towards them can can really make make a massive difference um, when someone opens up to us and of course then um, we might want to think together about um, maybe problem solving a situation they might be in but that's kind of almost secondary I think the main thing is just being being together and showing showing care really thank you I think that's good life advice <laughs> very very good advice um and I think when someone comes with, with a problem I think it's only human just to want to sort of like jump to sort of like problem solving and I think it's just acknowledging that um you know, we're not financial experts, but actually, you know, just having having that conversation is sometimes enough. Um, and we, we touched on it earlier when we spoke about the role of like managers and leaders. Um, and whilst they're there, you know, supporting their team members, um, it's important that they can just know that they can signpost. So I guess if you, um, you know, again, we'll share our handbook and um, there's lots of information out there of different, you know, charities and organisations that can support and um, to just start signposting them to somewhere else where they can get some, you know, financial guidance or, or, or more support, I think, um, would also be great. Um, we've got another question here. It's, um, it's quite specific, so you may not be able to um, answer this one, but um, are there any workshops that discuss the current stock market disruptions and advice on where to put our money now? Marta, I'm not sure if Questus have dealt with um, the stock markets or have any resources on or, or, or where we can signpost someone if they want to, to learn more. Um, well, I was going to say there is so much in the media right now, and there are a lot of pundits who are happy to tell you where they think you should be um, putting their money. Um, I myself am a self-directed investor, so this is not professional financial advice. I'm just kind of sharing my own personal perspective. Um, remember earlier we've been talking about, don't worry about the things that you don't have any control over. We don't have any control over the stock market. It's going to go up, it's going to go down. It's going to go up and down all the time. Um, so I think the most important thing that people can do is to take a longer term perspective, not worry so much about the day to day um, to, have a long-term plan um, and to stick with it um, even when the market is going crazy. Sometimes the best thing to do is nothing at all. And I, I think too, if you're not quite sure where to start, oftentimes, you know, especially for our retirement program, as an example, um, we offer employees you know, an opportunity to sit down with a financial advisor, even though it's through our retirement plan, they can sit down and have that at least initial discussions to look at the big picture. They can bring in their spouses or family members to have the whole picture view and start that conversation. But this is something that we try to promote heavily because employees just aren't aware. They thought, oh, it's only on the retirement plan. So 
I didn't know I could actually do this um, service. So I would say, you know, ask your HR or benefits team of any resources that you may not even be aware because it'll, oftentimes there may be something or at least something to get you started. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we've got through all the questions um, in the chat. So thank you everybody for sending those through. I really, really appreciate it. And I just wanna say a huge thank you to our panelists as well, like shared so much advice and, you know, taken away lots lot to myself and how I can definitely support myself in, in any sort of like financial concern, but also others. And um, Kimberly and Tom, just amazing to hear about the great work you're doing within your organizations, truly inspiring. So uh, thank you so much. Um, and Marta sort of like bringing your financial expertise um, and both with Sophia as well, like how that really links to our mental well-being and you know how we can support ourselves. Um, I know that's been amazing. Um, I'll just share a slide as well as I mentioned our handbook a couple of times um, so that you can um, grab the QR code and um, we will share that along with the recording um, after today as well. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks everyone. Yes, thank, thank you, you, everyone.